you know that we're doing that. Um, and go ahead and what is your full name? Josh Moriarty. Josh. All right, Josh. Yep. Um, just like I was explaining earlier, this is going to be a business mastermind session to start your locksmith business, or at least some of the moving parts to consider. And the reason I want to make this recording is because everybody's going to have the same questions. I had the same questions. You have them. And if you and I both have the same questions, there's a good chance that a lot of other people will have the exact same questions out there as well. So what I wanted to do was just answer all of those questions at once. And then people will be able to actually reflect and use this. And people will be able to learn. So you and I are helping inspire other people to start their businesses through the questions that you ask. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely, sure. Okay, cool. So what is the number one uh, question that you have? And, and kind of give us a little bit of background about you. What have you been doing? Where are you at now? And where do you want to go? Well, I've been working in the locksmith industry for about four years now um, as an independent contractor. Mm -hmm. And um, part of that is I'm filing, you know, taxes being self-employed, but I don't really have any personal expenses per se. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to learn a little bit more about that. And uh, I'd like to learn more about, you know, like you mentioned earlier, startup costs, you know, what the best, um, what the best strategy is for startup. Um, okay. You know, whether that be, you know, from the ground up or, or buying a pre-existing business um, with an established client base so um yeah okay great so what's the number one question that you have right now um it'd probably be around marketing you know like uh how do you market um with so much competition um you know with a startup company i was thinking that you know emergency services might be a good way to start because um people need it right away and you don't have to rely as much on you know being an established business it's more just whoever gets the call first what do you think about that uh so my personal opinion on that would be there it's a double-edged sword so you've got to think about this in two ways if i were to start advertising what's the first and most expensive key search words on google 24-hour locksmith or locksmith now locksmith near me those are going to be some of the most expensive ones. So you, you're, you're, you're on the right path in that you want to help those people that are the emergency services because they're probably going to call one of the bigger shops and the bigger shops are going to say, hey, we got a guy, but he's already on the job. He's going to be out there in an hour or two, whereas you can go buzz right over there. So that is good to have. And you need to start your business with that and then taking the after hours calls uh, that nobody else really wants to do is another way to really start focusing on that. The problem is, is that you need to watch the scammers, right? Uh, you're going to be competing for those high end, Google, those high end search terms or those high end words on like Google ads and, and things like that. So I would target that, but I would use other platforms to do it. I would use Facebook. I would use Instagram. I would use TikTok. I would use some of those other platforms to try and start marketing and targeting those categories because that there's just not as much competition there. Everybody, all the big guys, the scammers, all your competition, the big houses over there, they got 10 trucks. Um, they're all on Google and that's their main focal point. So with being small, you can kind of juke and jive and you can set up some things on other platforms that would actually probably provide a better return on investment. Um, I'd like to come over here and ha have you actually written a business plan out? Um, I'm sure I have like multiple different pieces of paper, you know, with, you know, business plans, um, but not like an official, not an official business plan though. Okay. That's actually going to be step number one in, in my personal opinion. Um, we did this seminar. We did some after hour seminars with myself and mark dawson who is the or was he just resigned uh after years and years of service but he he's he's got a uh, shop down in houston and he's got quite a few trucks i think he's got three or four trucks on the road you know he's pushing seven figures a year 
Um, he, he's doing a lot of the same things that we're, that I'm doing as well. And we really hit it off. And we offered this class at the Aloha Trade Show after hours. And it was all on business, how to get your business where you want it to be, marketing, getting started. You would be surprised how many people did not actually write out a business plan. And the reason I actually really bring that up is because it does a couple things. I know that it seems kind of redundant. I know you can store a lot of stuff up in your head, but there's a whole nother aspect of how your brain chemistry actually works. And this is all backed up by science, how your brain chemistry actually works when you then write it back down on paper, because that information has to go through a whole different channel path in your brain for it to come back out. So it comes in and you think about all these ideas. I want to have a van. I want to get these tools. The, I want to service safes. These are the customers that I want to service. I want to have an employee after, you know, the first two years. And I want to be making $250,000 in income. You can keep a lot of that in your head. But I promise you that actually writing it out and writing it down will groove it into a different slot in your brain. And it'll actually be at the more at the forefront of your mind. So you'll think about it more often. So you're much more likely to actually succeed. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Is there a platform that you recommend for writing a business plan? Yeah. So Workies right here, I just did a, a, a super basic search. Like I just right here, just locksmith uh, business startup. And we come to Workies, which is actually really cool because Workies is my, um, they're actually my uh, field management service as well. Uh, so they, they got a lot of things on their, on their plate and they can actually do a lot of things to really help your business. I would actually really look into getting workies for your business to start it simply because they're going to actually do a lot of the administrative things for you. So if, if you're like you ever get in a haircut or a dentist appointment and you get a text message two days before and then like another little reminder message, like right before you you go before your appointment is they yeah. have that software built in and I find that pretty handy. So I think that's a really good idea. And they offer that service. You set up to their text message program. It does all your electronic invoicing. It does, it basically takes the job of an internal operations person or a management or dispatcher. And it turns their job into a machine having that job. We all know that AI is taking over a lot of those type of jobs. So instead of paying somebody a yearly salary, you could quite literally use this program and it'll help your business. So here's 10 steps to start a locksmith business. And just like we talked about the other day, you know, your heart is pounding. Um, it, it's it's nerve wracking. It really is. Uh, I'm sure I can see it in your face. It's just it's scary. It's the unknown. But mm -hmm. by the same token, I also want to say to that. Um, what's the fear of, you know, working your whole life and making somebody else rich and putting money in their pocket? You know what I mean? Then they get the boat, they get the house, they get the retirement plan. Their family goes on the vacation to Hawaii and you're stuck making the money to pay for that. Why not put that money in your pocket and start building your future and start building your team with your people who want to work for you so that you can be that person when you're that age. Um, I have a terrible, terrible story about a guy who we bought out actually. And when we bought this guy out, um, he was like 80 years old and had one of the oldest locksmith shops in the Valley. And um, when he retired, he, didn't have anything like he he was like fifty thousand dollars in debt to his supplier um he thought he was going to walk away you know and and probably walk away with a million dollars by the time he thought he was going to sell his building for six hundred thousand he thought he was going to sell his business for you know half a million bucks he thought he was going to get all of this money and the reality of what actually happened is is everything was auctioned off for about thirty thousand dollars so went from 300 down to 30. Um, I think somebody bought his phone numbers and stuff. I, I couldn't tell you exactly how much that sold for, but I know it's not anywhere near what he wanted. 
Uh, and then the building ended up having to be condemned. And so he got a fraction of that too. So could you imagine working your whole life? And then at the end of it, when you're finally ready to retire and your body's too tired to work anymore, maybe walking away with a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars. I mean, I know that kind of sounds like a lot of money, but it's really no. not. You know, you get one no. one cancer, one heart attack, one medical issue, and that's all gone and then some these days. So I really, really want to take that fear away. That's what you should fear. If you're fearing anything, that's what you should fear. Don't fear going out and starting a business because what's the worst that can happen? I mean, actually think about it all the way to the end. Like you go for it, you go gung ho, you put your money, you put your time in, you build your business, you get a van, you get a client base, you get a website, you get an LLC going, you get checks coming in. And then the worst thing happens, maybe the economy crashes or something happens to you unforeseen. And what happens? You have to claim bankruptcy and then that's it. I mean, okay, then you're right back to working a normal job right where you were now, right? Yeah. It's not that not that scary all of a sudden when you look at it that way. Yes, failure is an option. Failure is always an option, but it's only an option as long as you entertain the idea. I'll tell you right now, the success to my business is I've never entertained failure as an option. It's just not. I know I've had days where I wake up and there's $500 in my bank account and I got to figure out how to make payroll in two days, right? That's part of being a business owner. Hey, I got to sell some stuff. Hey, I got to do some bill collecting. I got to jump on the phone and make money happen. And that's what it is. It's the FIO, figure it out along the way. Okay. That's mm -hmm. what really, really counts. So let's come back to this business startup here. Um, you throw a glance over your shoulder at your competition. Nope, you're not running a marathon. So let's get that business started. Uh, locksmiths are always in demand. And you want to know how much it costs to start a locksmith business without losing your life savings. So we'll run through each one of those steps. Uh, it can be paid or free options. And you can bootstrap your way to a... Uh, from an unhappy employee into a boss, okay? That's what you want to do, correct? Yeah. That's yeah. kind of the situation you're in. Do you, can you tell us just a little bit about the, the situation you're in? We don't have to go into too many details, but just kind of give people a little bit of a situation that you're in right now. Well, I've spent the last few years um, being on call, essentially, like 12 hours a day, five days a week. And on my days off, um, I'm also working because I'm scheduling jobs and, you know, getting getting jobs and scheduling them and it's basically i feel like i'm just working all the time and uh i was working toward a, a partnership with my employer that just wasn't really happening um even though i felt like i was putting all of my time into it it just uh we weren't moving forward at all in the partnership so i just start you know considering what the next step would be for my personal development because um, I want to continue to grow as an individual. And if I can't do that with um, my employer, then, you know, I have to start considering if I want to do that on my own. And um, yeah, I mean, I appreciate your help in all this. You know, that's definitely yeah. a resource that a lot of people don't have. I really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And we just just to let people know, you, I've kind of worked with you and you've, you've kind of been a client of my coaching services for what, about a year, year and a half now, maybe when we first started talking. Yeah. And um, so, you know, if you if you've called or text, you know, I try and reach out and give you a little bit of help. But now it seems like whatever you were working towards before, you've now hit a roadblock. Right. You've, you're kind of at an impasse. Um, people aren't holding up what you thought was established uh, as far as a business partnership look like what you wanted. And now you're thinking, hey, maybe it's time that I need to work on my own terms and not somebody else's terms. Right. And I know that, you know, taking that first step is something that a lot of people will wait to do until they're way later in life. And they have these, you know, obligations and responsibilities that I just don't have right now. Um, right. I don't have a mortgage. I don't have a family even. So um, right. I feel like, you know, as far as life goes you know this is probably the best time um, i think you're exactly right and usually for anybody else watching out there right now is the time because the right. longer you wait the harder it's going to be 
look, we're all going to show up in 10 years. In a decade, we will all arrive to wherever it is that we need to be. The question is, are you going to actually start planting the seeds now? Because they're going to take some time to take root and grow to where you have what you wanted in the future, right? You need to plant the seeds now so that you can harvest in the future. Uh, I took this business over in 2012. And I mean, it was barely making $80,000 a year. And I've pretty much 10 X that even, even more than that. And I attribute that simply because we planted those seeds and each year our goal was, Hey, how do we double what we did last year? Okay. If we made that goal, great. How do we do it again? And how do we do it again? And how do we do it again? And just constantly having that next barrier, that next goalpost set up is really the key to getting everything going. So the first thing that we need to do is research the locksmith market. Um, customer calls in urgently and needs your services. Can you predict what they want? Uh, what city they're in? How about their services? Uh, what are they going to need next year? Uh, with market research, you can. Uh, research is the foundation of a business and a locksmith deserves to really take this stuff seriously. So you can do some free research uh, tools right here with current customer, uh, conduct a survey for customer challenges, uh, online reviews. Customers are heated about a hundred dollar charge. Did the locksmith install gold knobs that didn't match the silver home? Uh, take notes at your, about your competitors' blunders and take advantage of that. Okay. Uh, research firm, the IBIS World Experts, analyzed that 22,500 locksmith businesses in their in depth report. And you can get that for about a thousand bucks. So I don't know if you are able to afford that or not or be able to use that. But um, those are definitely some some resources, and they're actually really, really right about the um, the way that that works. So, have you done some market research? Yeah, I've done uh, what you mentioned earlier. Um, I've you know I've gone online and looked at reviews, and um, when I was trying to figure out what you know pricing looked like in the market, um, I would actually mm -hmm. call other locksmith companies acting like an interested client and um you know asking for quotes over the phone just to get an idea of you know what other people were charging for similar services um yeah. but you mentioned ibis yes okay and that's something that's like a one-time payment or is that subscription based i believe it's just a one-time payment for their report but you'd have to click this little button right here um you can go to this workies page or just like i did um how to start a locksmith business real simple google search uh, mm -hmm. this workies should pop right up for you that's awesome okay and that's workies w-o-r-k-i-z uh kind of a funky spelling of it but um that's that's how that works there um and again i would i would bring this back to your core business plan as well and we'll kind of go over that a little bit too uh so understanding your market you can you can sell anything but there has to be a market for it right um getting your education or get educated starting a locksmith business feels like pulling off a heist uh if you wonder if you're ever going to get halfway through and that nagging voice in your head asks you if you really have the chops to pull it off uh, you may face a steeper learning curve than other locksmiths but luckily you don't need a four year degree. Okay. So that's kind of the nice thing about it is that you can, you can get started right away. And I don't have a college degree. Um, I, I just, I had to hit the ground running. Uh, I, we probably have similar backgrounds where, Hey, you know, I, I had to survive to get out of high school. Uh, I wasn't even living at home when yeah. I was in high school. Uh, I had to work. I had to work, and then I had to actually get my or my um, high school diploma through the on-job training program, uh, meaning that I got credit from work because I had to work and pay rent because I was not living at home. I was either going to work or be homeless and have to finish high school, uh, basically. So we 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 kind of come from some hard knocks <laughs> background, you know. Yeah. But, yeah um, I mean, as you know, I grew up like in the foster system, and um, you know, yeah. out of high school, I was you know living out of a car and you know, just working every day. So, yeah. Yeah. Just whatever we can do to survive and day to day. But now here uh, with the proven dedication and you use that, see that, that pain and that drive, that's what I use for fuel. 
Every time you pull up your phone and the bank account doesn't look like it has enough money in it to do what you need to do for that week, you use that pain, you use that drive, and you turn it into fuel and power. And then that's what gives you the motivation to make those sales calls, make those cold calls, reach out to existing clients to see if they need more work done, do your bill collecting, sell something if something needs to be sold, buy something if something needs to be bought. It gives you the power and the drive to actually keep moving forward. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so these are just some of your other uh, like incomes here. Choose your locksmith specialization. Uh, do you dream of spending your days on an ignition switch or cylinder repairs? If so, how to start a locksmith, a car locksmith business would be your next question. Um, a business, <clears throat> a profitable business specializes in one area and charges top dollar for it. Uh, I, I definitely agree with that. Uh, when you focus on one area, you can invest quality time and money into the auto tools or the safe tools or the electronic access installation tools that you need and focus specifically on that. There's usually really three niches that locksmiths can work in, residential, uh, commercial, automotive. I'm going to go ahead and add safe and vault on here too. And then really in this day and age, there's also the security uh, locksmith as well. So the um, like the electronic access side of things um, and CCTV cameras, alarm systems. Uh, unfortunately, I really do believe that the locksmiths left a lot of money on the table. And really, one of the things that I'm doing is I, I did a lot of safe installation and safe work, mostly because there was no competition. Uh, I also liked being one of the five people in the entire state that could actually do some of the moves and some of the things that we've done. Uh, I got a call to move two 5,500 pound safes in Salt Lake because there's nobody in between Denver and Salt Lake that was actually capable or had the equipment or knowledge to do that job. So I charged a ludicrous amount of money to do that job. And it was very profitable. However, after having back surgery this year uh, in April, I had back surgery. I just don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to risk that happening. When you start looking at the profit margins of, hey, I can charge three grand to install uh, a safe, that's great. But when you compare it to a $250,000 back surgery, all of a sudden it's not so profitable anymore. So right. I'm actually kind of changing. So that was, that was my specialization was safe moving. And then now I still open safes. You, you do a lot of that too. And it's kind of a niche category. Um, so opening safes is, is kind of my niche. And then I, uh, almost all locksmiths do residential. I mean, almost anybody, you, can go out there and rekey a quick set or a schleg lock. Um, commercial is kind of back and forth. Some people all do commercial work. Some people don't. Some people specialize in it. Uh, some people won't touch it at all. And then we have automotive as well. And automotive is really, really big, but it's also really, really competitive. So I really caution people, uh, before you invest in all that equipment, are you? will your area sustain? Can you charge top dollar for that key? One of the main reasons that I didn't go into automotive is number one, I just don't like it. Uh, I tried it. I took some classes. Uh, I don't like ripping out computer boxes and stuff and, and flashing CPUs. And, you know, I, I just don't like doing all that electronic stuff. My brain doesn't function that way. And if you've ever done automotive work, you also know that you've been in some pretty nasty cars, right? You go into change somebody's ignition or work on their car even just plugging in ODB ports and stuff, you know, you got trash McDonald's wrappers and dirty diapers and Kleenexes and spit chewed tobacco bottles and just, just nasty, nasty environments. Uh, so that's why I chose not to really go so much into automotive, but anybody that does, you can make a lot of money with it. Um, I mean, these chip keys now are, you know, four or five, six hundred dollars depending on where you get them from. Like if you go to get them from the dealer. So, Picking one thing when you're getting started out and focusing on that is going to be one of your better bets. What are you going to be focusing on mostly? Um, yeah, I agree with what you're saying about the automotive. Um, another thing I've noticed is you have to have a pretty large inventory on hand um, of all the different keys and stuff that you're not necessarily selling right away. So I mm -hmm. think the overhead costs might be higher for starting something like that opposed to, you know, something with safes and you're just getting the drill rig and some general equipment and now you can go open these safes. 
Um, so yeah, that's definitely going to be my focus. And that's the thing that I really enjoy doing is the safe work. Um, we've done a couple hundred safes the last few years and, um, every single one of them has just been exciting, you know, when the yeah. door swings, I mean, it's just, uh, it never gets boring for me. And, uh, I've never been much of a car guy, um, as far as, you know, just general interest in vehicles. So, yeah. I think you just got to do, yeah, which, what you enjoy. And that's what I found. I really enjoy, but I don't mind the tedious, um, you know, reeking a quick set. I don't mind that. Um, I enjoy, you know, doing like master systems. I'm trying to become more educated on like CCTV and access control, that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. cause I do see like the industry leaning in that direction, especially in a commercial sense. Um, yeah. so yeah, I want to continue to educate myself on those. And I was going to ask you, um, when did you find train uh, time to do training while you were relying on your own labor um, to, uh, to do the business? That's a really good question. And this is one of the this is one of the biggest obstacles that new locksmiths actually face is where do I get education? I need to get more education. Where do I get it and how do I do so? Um, that's also kind of the drive behind my entire career because <laughs> when i started in 2012 there was no youtube there was no lock picking lawyer there was no mr locksmith there was none of these people online uh posting this information you had to go to a seminar you had to go to an association trade show and you had to learn with one other person or you had to train with a locksmith and I'll, I'll, just to give you a, an idea of how much, how little locksmiths used to share information, the guy who trained me, who I bought my business from, he said when he was learning and training at the same shop, he's supposed to be learning how to do his job. And when they would train him, the guy would put a rag over his hand when he was shimming a cylinder so that you couldn't see what he was doing. And I'm like, how are you supposed to learn if they're not going to actually teach you what they're doing? But that's how secretive this industry used to be. So you used to have to go to a trade show. You have to wait once a year, save up thousands and thousands of dollars, buy a plane ticket or drive or travel or do whatever you need to do to get out there. Uh, you're buying food every day at an expensive hotel. So you're, you're spending, you know, 50 bucks a day on food at least. Um, then you got to pay for the classes, which... You know, they're usually two, three hundred dollars a piece uh, for all week, you know. So so, you know, you're spending another thousand or more on classes, probably about twelve, thirteen hundred dollars on classes. And, you know, you that's just if you just sit there and go. And now here's the biggest chunk of what you missed. You have been at training all week and you don't have employees. So you have no income for that time period as well. Right. So. Right. This is a very big problem. I added it up and, and to go to a one week long trade show cost the average locksmith $10,000 or more by the time you add up expenses and lost income. So that is actually the motivation behind what I do and how I'm doing everything that I'm doing. This is why I put YouTube videos out for people to learn from and watch and see. This is why I have my private training program <clears throat> for things that are not fit to be on YouTube. Uh, called wayneslockshop.com. So I send people over there and they can learn at their own pace. That means they can go run calls for the day and then they can come back home and they can learn on the video at their pace. Now, video learning is never going to have the exact same effect as hands-on learning, but what it'll do is it'll give you a foundation so that when you get your hands-on training, it'll actually enhance it and maximize it. And it'll let you know, is this something I want to do? When somebody sees how much it takes for me to drill open a safe and open it, is that something they want to do? Is it something they want to do to be able to program that car key? Is it something they want to do to be able to spend all day and in install an electronic access control? Uh, program. It gives them the opportunity to do so. So that's actually the motivation of why I started what I started. So you can go to wayneslockshop.com. You can check it out there. There's lots of training videos. Um, I, I submit training videos for Aloha, the Associated Locksmiths of Aloha. They give them out free all the time. So that's really taking advantage of everything that you can get for free is priority number one taking advantage of everything that your local supplier, like you're, you're kind of over there by IML. So anytime mm -hmm. IML does training or courses, 
They're very affordable. They're factory technicians. Um, and so, you know, you're going to get a good education and it's usually only a couple of days. So you only have to take a day or two off instead of a whole week. So that's really the best way that you can get education on how to do your job out in the field. Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. And um, I was also going to ask about the IML certifications. Are those like one, two day classes? Are those credible when you're trying to, let's say, apply for like an SBA loan? Um, can you use those as credible certifications to get business loans? So that's going to be a really good question. And the way I would answer it is you got your certificate. So your certificate shows that you took the class. So you can turn those certificates in and say, look, I put in the time I took this class. Now, the biggest difference between Colorado and let's say Texas or some other state is they have licensing. And because they have licensing, they need to have what's called CEU credits or continued education credits. So you can call ALOA, A-L-O-A dot org. And any classes that I provide, they are already granted the accreditation. So you can actually buy your CEU credits for $35 a piece. I believe it's $35. That's what it was last time I checked. Don't hold me to that number. That number can fluctuate. But you can actually purchase those credits through there. Now, if you took the training at IML and you have the actual certificate, that's called factory direct training. I don't see why it wouldn't. I can't speak for the state. I can't speak for the SBA. I can't speak for ALOA. But all of those numbers add up to where if you were to call and say, hey, here's my certificate. Can I buy some CEU credits for this so that I can get credit for it for my SBA loan? I'm sure that they would be happy to do so. Right. And I guess it does. It gives you an edge on the guy that doesn't have the certifications. Correct. Yes. Uh, they make great content posts, like all of these ones behind me right here. Right. Mm -hmm. I take pictures of them, post it online, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Now what you're doing is, is your your feed is getting in there with other people, you know, and other people in your area. And they see your name, your account flash with a certificate. They're going to say, hey, this guy's taking some training. He's in school. He knows what he's doing. I'm going to call that guy instead of the scammer guy who has no certificates and just a stupid flashy app, right? Mm -hmm. And that was uh, one of my concerns with starting up is when you're, when you're coming from the ground up, you don't necessarily have like the newest van and the wrap, you know, and it looks mm -hmm. super professional. You're kind of, you're starting out of a, uh, you know, lower cost vehicle and it might not look as professional. Um, what what are some what is some advice that you'd have to avoid um, the perception of being a scammer when you're starting out when it's just you have a lower capital to work with? Well, I wouldn't say that anybody uh, would necessarily think that just simply having an older vehicle makes you look like a scammer. What I would say is how you what you do with what you have is probably going to be more important. Um, what kind of vehicle are you going to try and try and get going or what are you running out of now? That was one of my questions. Um, if, if you had a recommendation for like a certain make or model. Uh, Ford has been really good to me. Um, so the Ford Econoline vans, uh, the Ford trucks seem to be really good for me too. I had a diesel Ford F-350 with almost half the miles. Uh, so if that gives you any kind of context or clue as to what kind of vehicle works. Nice. Um, I had one, I had one van that lasted about 250,000 miles and then the motor finally blew on it. Uh, that was their V8 motor. Uh, I've had, I've just bought another 2001 van with a V10 motor. And that seems, seems to, that thing seems to be going pretty good too. Um, but yeah, I mean, just, just all those different things um kind of add up to to what really works uh the original owner had an astro van it worked okay the transmission went out at about 150,000 miles anything that i'll tell you is if you buy a van or you buy a truck you need to also have an additional three or four thousand dollars laying around so that when the tranny goes not if when the tranny goes when the engine needs some maintenance when things happen if your total budget is $10,000, let's just take that as a, as a random number, okay? If you're starting out, you take your $10,000 and you split it in half. 
immediately. You put half into a checking account and half into a savings account, okay? Because you will always use more money than you think, no matter what. There's always going to be something that comes up. There's always going to be something that happens. There's always going to be an unexpected expense, and you need to be prepared for that. OK, I can't tell you how many times having three or to five grand in a savings account at a separate bank has literally been the difference of me going out of business or staying in business. One thousand percent. So one of the things that we'll do here is I'll actually share. Um, I'll share this other one right here with the little Subaru that I bought. So there's a couple ways to go about it. Uh, I, I've I've had different vehicles, everything from a thousand dollar Subaru that we built up to uh, to a you know a hundred thousand dollar F three fifty diesel Tremor twenty twenty right and everything in between. So here's the little Subaru that I had, and the reason that I actually bought this little guy was because I had this. You see, I have these toast toast pieces right here. If I have to take my van into the shop, I lose twice. We just talked about that with training. You lose time. And money while you're down, you lose mm-hmm. money because you're paying to have it fixed. So now you have no income and you're not running. So what I would actually do is take this little guy, throw the tow bar on it, drive my van down to the shop, drop the van or the car off, whichever one needed to be worked on, and then drive the other vehicle. And I could at least go out and pin for the day. See, I had a little pinning mat, a little, just a little toolbox stuffed in the back seat, a little power inverter, 600 watt power inverter, a battery charger some long reach tools and just a little pin kit and some tryout keys like this. And I literally ran out of this. I also, after that, now I have two vehicles, right? Okay. So now I have two vehicles. Well, what does that mean? Now I can hire an employee, right? Once I get going pretty well, now I can hire an employee. And you can see that I, I wrapped that myself. I ordered the vinyl off of Vinyl Giant. I literally bought that car for like 800 bucks, bought some vinyl from vinyl, vinyl Giant for 200 bucks, blacked it out, called the other company, had the other stickers made for another 50 or 100 bucks, and then just put them on there. And that vehicle, it is older. It doesn't look fancy. But when I show up, people know what I do. People understand the concept. And I never really felt judged, even in the high-end Aspen area that I'm in now, uh, for for having that. I just never did, you know? Yeah, no, thanks for sharing that with me. Um, Because it did, even though, I mean, it still looks professional with the wrap and everything. And Mm -hmm. um, you didn't have to, you know, take out a, a loan, you know, for that car, I'm sure. So that's one of the main keys to my success is... Uh, to not be in debt, you know, just not be in debt. That's one of the biggest things is not be in debt. Um, here's a picture of the van. So this is the van that I was used in conjunction with that car. And again, you can see we're blacked out. Um, and then this van actually made it into business fleet magazine, right? So then we started getting some real notoriety for that. So there's just a, a 99 Econoline Ford F. 250 van. And these are really the workhorses of the, of the industry. Um, I I don't Here Here's my philosophy on different van manufacturers. Um, Chevy and GMC had a pretty decent van, but their express version was usually all wheel drive. Now you might think that's a good thing, but the problem with all wheel drive is, is, is all wheel drive all the time. That van was like a pickup truck four wheel drive. Like you have the shifter on the floor, right? So I could disengage it from four wheel drive so that I'm not using so much fuel and causing so much wear and tear on the transfer case and on the front end parts. Um, You'll notice with the Chevy vans, they're very hard to align because the independent front suspension, you have to weight your van a certain way because they're not on a on a box frame like the the vans are from Ford. The Ford van is a truck. I mean, it's a truck. It's a short nosed truck. That's kind of why I like them. And they've just, the Fords have always seemed a little bit more heavy duty uh, to me. Now, if you're talking about something newer, like these new transits and stuff like that, I've heard nothing but good things about the EcoBoost motor. Um, they're they're really good. You can even get a little power stroke motor. Uh, they make them four wheel drive now as well. 
So a transit would be a great way to go. But again, now you're now are you going to go into debt to do that? Are you going to be able to find a used one? Are you going to be able to go plunk down 40 or 50 grand for that brand new van? Uh, and, and people get this twisted all the time. Just because you bought a brand new van and it's under warranty doesn't mean that it's not going to break down at all. Uh, I, I have some other stories from another locksmith who works here locally. He bought one of those Dodge, um, whatever the, the, what's the Dodge one? It's not Sprinter. Sprinter is Mercedes. But you know what I'm talking about, the the Dodge vans, yeah. the Pro, uh -huh. Pro Master. Uh, okay. And, you know, it, just speaking from what I've honestly heard uh, from him, within the first 30,000 miles, he had to replace the radiator and the transmission and several other parts. Now, I don't know about you, but if my old F-350 with a diesel motor running around with half a million miles on it can get me that far, I'm pretty skeptical of something that needs to be fixed and needs that much repair after 30,000 miles, right? Yeah. So, yeah, uh, but the four and, um, fans did pretty good. This one, this one lasted about 250,000 miles and then it spit a rod right out of the side of the motor, unfortunately. <laughs> Did not have to replace the transmission. Uh, transmission lasted the entire time. But the main problem with these vans and engines is because of the snub nose van, it was going to be like 10 grand to get it fixed. Well, I took that 10 grand and bought that F-350 diesel pickup truck that at that time probably had 180,000 miles on it. And I've racked it up darn near to half a million. So I think I got my money's worth out of it. Yeah, I'd say. What, uh, what model was that van? Uh, the one that I just showed, that was a 99 Ford F-350 with the Triton V8. I would not recommend the Triton V8 in the future. Uh, I would go for the diesel, the, um, not the 6.0. The, the 7.3 liter diesel is a good motor, and the V10 is a good motor as well. And you're, uh, you're like up in the mountains, aren't you? Yeah. Yep. So you have to... Uh get something a bit bulkier for like when it snows, I, I assume. Correct. Yeah. Snow tires and four wheel drive are pretty much a, a mandatory on that. Yeah. And then was and there, then, um, was that part of your business model to try to uh, move somewhere with less competition? It wasn't part of my original, original business model. No. Um, it was, uh, it was out of necessity. That's where that's where the um, <clears throat> that's where the job was. So basically, what my kind of origin or backstory is, I was working the oil field. That was the easiest way to get money. You know, we we're talking about being broke right out of high school and stuff. So the first thing I did is I was like, okay, I need to make more money. I've got a family, pregnant wife, kid on the way. You know, the whole family or the whole life sandwich just slapped right in my lap. Um, so I started out doing other jobs. Then I got my CDL. Um, that was the quickest way for me to start making more money was to start driving truck. Uh, so I got a terrible job stacking shingles on roofs in Grand Junction, Colorado, when it's about 117 degrees and your sneakers quite literally start melting to the roof as you're running across this roof so that I could get my CDL. Yes, I did that. I was in the best shape of my life though. Uh, couldn't, yeah. couldn't do that now. No way, no way. But uh, keeping moving up the ladder, then we became equipment operator. That paid more money, more skills, more money, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the 2008, 2009 collapse happened. Luckily, I was working out of the oil field, even though the oil field collapsed at that time. I was actually working at a company called Grand Junction Pipe, which was the largest gravel manufacturer in the whole area. And because we had those rebuilding road contracts, it got us through the recession. It was one of those companies where somebody had to die before you got a job there. And that's literally what happened. I came out of the oil field and somebody died and I just so happened to apply. And I was one of those gung ho people like, I don't need paperwork. Put me in the piece of equipment and I'll show you I can run the doggone thing. You know, mm. that's yeah. kind of how it works. So then I had the job there fairly stable for a while, then got laid off from that. And I told them, I was like, hey, if you guys don't bring me back, I'm, I'm not coming back. If you lay me off, I'm not coming back. And um, that's it. Then this business came up for sale. Um, had to move. I basically had to move, leave my family and, and move an hour and a half away and live out of a hotel for three months um, and learn this trade and make the transition, bring my family up here, buy a house. Uh, and it's the best decision I've ever made in my entire life. And it was scary. 
and add into all the fear that you have right now, and then add into that the security of your entire family and moving to a completely new place where you've never lived or been before, that's a lot of stress. But you just have to think about it as sink or swim, basically. So. Yeah, and those, those are the risks that a lot of people aren't willing to take, and that's why they don't uh, end up owning their own businesses. Yep, and that's so. when you show up and you, you're 65 and looking to retire and that nobody has enough money to retire. Like, look at, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get all political here, but uh, if you think that the government is going to be able to take care of you when your time to reach uh, your retirement age, I I sincerely hope everybody out there who's has a has a backup plan to that because it's not going to be what you need to live your life at your standards at that age from everybody uh, that I've talked to. Everybody tends to run out of money before they run out of uh, time here, unfortunately. And so I wanted to make sure that that never happens to myself and that never happens to my family. And that fear is greater than the fear of getting started and pushing through any of the obstacles or problems that we have along the way. So, well, yeah, and even uh, even at my age, like um, a lot of my friends just live in studio apartments and have two jobs. And uh, like, that's why I'm pursuing starting my own business, because uh, just working a normal job these days isn't, isn't cutting it at all. It's not enough inflation. Everything's out to get you. And then let's say you do finally get upright and you finally do get to where you're making enough money at a job and you have insurance and you're able to put a little bit of money away for savings and a rainy day, that rainy day is coming. I mean, th even just today, the Asian markets just tanked. I'm sure ours are going to be very severely affected by that. And the economy is probably headed for a recession right now, um, to be perfectly honest. Luckily, the locksmith industry is fairly recession resistant. I mean, guess what happens when people are doing good and they're hiring people, they're investing in security and cameras and upgrades and electronic access and all these other things. Same thing happens when it goes downhill too. the banks are repoing homes. People are losing their jobs. Uh, I can't tell you how many places in COVID during COVID times, the gyms, gyms were my number one clients. They wanted to send people home. And then when the people didn't want to come back to work, you remember in like 2021, 2022, people didn't want to come back to work. The gym owners were like, cool, stay home. I'll keep your paycheck. And they installed an electronic access system that then took that person's job. So now they paid me 10 grand to put this system in and save themselves 30 grand from that employee through the year. You know, mm -hmm. so those are just some of the things that that can come that can come up from that. Uh, and you just you just never know. So it, I really, really am a firm believer in making sure that you take things into your own control and you make sure that you're taking care of your future your way. And one of the best ways to start doing that is we talked about before um, when we taught that when D Mark Dawson and I taught that class, I was epically surprised, shocked, practically blown away at how few people actually have a written business plan written down somewhere. I cannot stress how important this is. This is mandatory. I know everybody wants to keep it in your head and keep it in your brain. And you think that, oh, I'll just remember it. It actually goes through different neural pathways in your brain to be able to actually absorb the information, think about the information, store the information, and then write it back down. I say it out loud and then I write it back down. That means the information's come in, it's grooved itself into my head and then it comes back out and I'm just, it's like its like walking over a, a path of grass, right? You start to make a trail and you start to really groove that in there deeper so that it's that much deeper inside your head when you actually need to come through it and it'll actually help you stay on track. So a business plan uh, is a document of your goals. And people can go the other way too. They can get way too complicated with this. It should not be overcomplicated. But this is your roadmap, okay? If we were to if we if we were to say, hey, we've got a vault to go open in Dallas, Texas, what's the first thing that we're gonna do? We're gonna come up with a plan. We need to find a map. We need to put it into GPS. We need to see what routes we need to take and the alternate routes in case one of those routes gets blocked off, correct? Mm -hmm. Same thing here. So we need to have 
you can you can hire somebody to write a business plan for a hundred bucks. There's a bunch of free templates. Like I said, I just Googled how to start a locksmith business and this workies uh, thing came up right here. So um, an executive summary. Uh, we've got a company description. Uh, we do market research, which we talked about earlier. Uh, organization and management. We're going to have services and products. Uh, we're going to have marketing and sales. And then we're going to have funding and finance. So we've already talked about market research a little bit. What market research have you done? Um, like I mentioned earlier, like uh, I've, I've tried to do some like market analysis in terms of figuring out what what uh, what people are charging, what kind of costs are involved in starting up. Um, and I think the, the marketing aspect is is what I'm really trying to learn more about. Um, okay. do, you, do you run Google ads? You said you, you use social media? Yeah, yeah, I use social media. Uh, do you have a social media account for your, your personal account? And then do you have one for your company as well, separate? Um, yeah, I mean, a personal account, of course, but uh, I'm going to work on the, the business one for sure. I, I have a one bedroom apartment and I've just brought my bed into my living room so that I can use my bedroom as in like a, as an office. Sure. And I think there's tax write-offs for that. And yeah. then I could start to create content in that room. Yes. That's a great idea. That's a fantastic idea. Uh, so as far as marketing goes, is your business Google guaranteed? Well, I haven't started my business yet. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So the first thing that I do is uh, I'm going to start with the Secretary of State and file your business. So you need to come up with a business name. Okay. Come up with your name. Don't spend a whole lot of time on it. A name is not going to make or break you. Okay. It is, I mean, unless you pick an absolutely horrible name, but you know, let's, let's just go off of generalizations here. So Pick, pick a, a general name, whatever you think, whatever means something to you, uh, and then add the word locksmith or safe service or whatever your specialty is going to be. And then um, basically kind of kind of work on it from there. So the first thing that you need to do is either contact an attorney uh, or a legal service like LegalZoom or Legal Shield. OK, either one. I don't have an affiliation. Um, but those companies will be able to help you out and they will walk you through the process of establishing your business. I would normally start a sole proprietor, uh, or an LLC, right? A uh, limited liability company. And the advantages to starting that, do you know what the advantages are? Um, like the difference between sole proprietor and LLC? Or yeah. just having the coverage. Uh, just, ha just having the coverage. Yeah. Well, I know that, like, if someone disputes something, they can't attack your personal assets, right? It's just business-related right. assets. It's a shell. Right. It, it helps protect you. So if you go out there and you break somebody's car, or we damage their safe, or you're moving a safe and it falls through their house, uh, they're not going to sue you directly as an individual. They will sue the company. And they may take all the company's money, but they're not going to take you, your money and your house away. OK, so that's why it's really, really important to make sure that you get that step done and then keep everything completely separate. Do not um, they call it piercing the veil. Do not use your company account for personal expenses. Do not use your personal expenses for company expenses. Draw a clear line between the two. Say this five thousand dollars or this ten thousand dollars this is my seed money this is my startup money and you take it out of your personal account and you put it into that company account and then you put all of your expenses and run all of your expenses through that account that way okay oh so you should First have a separate account. business account oh yes yes and uh do you do like a separate phone number too like separate business phone? yes well so there's a couple ways to go about that um if you want to have the company pay for your phone entirely, I personally have a business plan with my phone. So I, I pay for my phone for my guys. Uh, I pay for my phone through the company and you can choose how you want to do that. I do it because then the company buys me a new phone every year. 
or every other year or whenever it needs to buy a phone. Whenever it's time to buy a phone, the company buys the phone as opposed to me buying it. Um, or if something happens to it, that and I use the phone so much. I mean, my my cell phone bill is gosh five six hundred dollars a month with all of the text messages and uh, you know we've got five or six lines attached to it. So that's a pretty hefty mm -hmm. bill from a um, personally. So I have that set up through the company. But yeah, you definitely want two separate, completely separate bank accounts, and then that other one is strictly a business bank account. If you don't do that then if you do get sued or something happens, they can come after your personal account and your personal funds and they'll freeze your bank account until you deal with court. And that who knows how long that is. We know the wheels of justice turn very, very slow, right? Yeah, years, I'm sure. Yeah, so, so you don't want to have your personal money tied up for that long. And I hate to do that, but you always have to think about everything as worst case scenario, right? How do I protect <laughs> myself? How do I cover my assets? in the event of something bad happening, because just like your car, it's not if, it's when. I've had three people sue me, okay? None of them got any money, but they tried. And I think I'm a pretty decent, honest businessman. Um, and my company is all based off of integrity and trust and honesty. However, that's not how they saw it. They saw it completely different and they were not happy with the way that things worked out for them, even though we had it all documented. And obviously because we've won all of those cases, um, you know, we did, I did my due diligence paid off or somebody else might have my company right now. So step number one, go to the secretary of state, choose your name, choose your business name, go to the secretary of state of Colorado, register that business, or have legal zoom legal shield or an attorney do so the next step is to get a cpa okay now when you're interviewing and this is where you need to make that huge mindset shift okay it's not you're not going to go see one professional and they're going to have all the answers they're people too and there are layers to the grade of attorney and cpa that you're going to interview if they don't understand your business, <clears throat> they're not going to do a very good job for you. Okay. So I recommend you interview at least three CPAs and three attorney services before actually selecting one and picking one. Real interviews, not just a phone call, an actual face to face interview or a Zoom call like this or a Google meeting. You want to get to know this person because you are quite literally counting on them to know the things that you don't know. It would be like, walking into a room and one person is blind, you're blindfolded, and the other person has to lead you through the room. You have to have trust and rapport to do that because they are guiding you through the legal system so that you don't bump into any unwanted obstacles along the way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right. So make sure that it, this is the most important part. This is pouring the foundation. If you don't get this part right, the whole building's going to come down when you try and build on top of it. So a qualified, competent CPA that understands our industry and understands your needs is the most valuable thing you can have. And the second thing would be an attorney. That's all there is to it. Then they'll and tell now, you. Are you hiring them for their services when you need to use their services or you're hiring them as like an employee? Uh it will only be a matter of time before you need them. Um, my CPA, so I have, I, I kind of chunk it down. A CPA charges a lot of money. So I actually have a bookkeeping service too. So my bookkeeper does all the books. They run payroll. They do bill collections. They keep track of all of the billing and administrative um, tasks. Okay. So I pay them uh, between 30 and 50 bucks an hour, somewhere in there. Right. And then my CPA is like 150, 180 bucks an hour. She just does my taxes. So the bookkeepers, I pay them the smaller fee so that they get everything all nice and ready and in line and in queue so that they can hand a nice pretty package over to my CPA who then says, okay, box check, do taxes. I pay them 1,200, two grand, whatever for the year uh, to do my taxes. And then that's it, I'm done. Oh, you pay now, them two grand, not the IRS. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. here's the deal. I, I, my CPA doesn't cost me one penny. My CPA does not cost me one penny. The amount of savings that they save me from getting all the tax refunds and the tax rebates and the intelligence that they have, they save mm -hmm. me $10,000 plus. So 
they save me $8,000 a year, not cost me $2,000. That's the mindset shift that you really have to get in play so that you can understand where to spend money and why. If I spend two grand on my CPA that saves me 10, that's a return on investment. That's ROI. Okay. Big, big stuff right there. Um, same way with an attorney. Hey, you saved me from getting sued for $60,000. That's, I paid them five. <laughs> that's a pretty good return, right? That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good way to go about it. I, I like those numbers. I like those odds. And you really have to think about it in, I am investing in an attorney. I am investing in a CPA and I'm investing in my bookkeepers to keep everything that I don't do well, that I do poorly. I source that out to them. Okay. So that way I can be a locksmith. I'm also not my mechanic. Okay. All too often, here's the deal. I can go out and I can go install a continuous hinge for $500 plus an hour right now. Charge $750 to install that hinge. Hinge cost me 150 bucks. 50 bucks in shipping, and I can install it in 20 or 30 minutes. That means I'm making $500 an hour. I can go open a safe. Might take an hour, $500 to $1,000 an hour. Go open a bank vault, six to $10,000 to open that. That's my skill set. I'm going to use my time being a locksmith, doing what I do professionally, not changing my oil, not changing my alternators, not working on my vehicles, not doing bookkeeping, not doing bill collecting, and certainly not doing taxes, okay? I'm going to pay those other professionals to do their profession their way, right? My bookkeeper doesn't work on her locks. My attorney doesn't do this access control on her building. They pay me to do it. So that's a concept that people really need to start understanding is you're not paying for another service just to pay for another service. You're paying them to save you money in the long run. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's helpful. Um, okay. And I think, you know, going from employee to business owner, you have to start changing your mindset in that way. You do. You do. Uh, another terrible trap that people get laid in here. Um, actually, let's just go through the rest of this real quick. So do you know what an a executive summary is? No. If, if not, it's okay. It's just a written account that gives an overview of the main points of the longer report of the business plan. So if you were to summarize your business plan in one paragraph, how would you summarize your business plan? Who are you and what oh, okay. are you going to do? Is it is it, is it kind of like a mission statement? Yes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So what is your mission okay. statement for your company? Are you asking me? Yeah, I'm asking. People dodge this question. Um, I would like to build a company. I want to build a company that involves, um, like you said, integrity and honesty and um, providing professional services to people, but also in the business. Um, I want to treat the employees like like family almost like i want it i want it to you know if someone considers leaving for whatever reason i i don't want it to be a decision like i want them like they're a part of something when they start out um and i would like to create community within the business um because okay. i've i've lived most of my life um without community and family and stuff and i think a business would be a really cool opportunity to include people in your success and to build other people up around you too not just build yourself up you know that's exactly right and that's exactly how i started working on things too um i don't know if you might want to get a little bit closer to a router or something you're starting to freeze up just a little bit um but uh that it's called building a team i don't have employees I have teammates. I have team members. Okay. And those team members, I count on them. An employee, an employee clocks in a little late, does the bare minimum to get their paycheck, leaves a little early every day, and could really give two craps about you or your company. That's what an employee does. Okay. The difference between an employee and a team member or a teammate is as a team, we work together. So a teammate shows up early right? A teammate does everything humanly possible and puts out 100% for the, 
for that day to get that day's work done to put the money in the bank. A teammate doesn't leave when it's five o'clock. They leave when the job is done. They leave when you're, you're satisfied. You know what I mean? They do what it takes. They have more of a mindset like you do because you're invested, right? If your business doesn't make it, you don't get a paycheck. Well, they don't seem to realize that either because it's easier for them to go get another job, right? They don't have to have all the worry of headache and overhead and all the other things. But you also do need to be a little careful about getting too close to an employee because there may come a time where there's just not enough work and you may have to let that person go. If you have too much of a personal relationship with that person, you're not going to be able to do it. You're not going to be able to let a guy go who has got a wife and two kids uh, and, and you'll ride it out too far and then your company will be in jeopardy. So there is a fine line. And I do like the idea and concept of treating employees better and creating teams and teammates instead of employee-employer relationships. Um, but it has to come, the profession and the company always have to come first. So if you do have to lay somebody off, or if they do make a very, very large mistake and damage the brand of your company, you still always, always have to be willing to make that call and let that person go. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it makes sense. Okay. All right. Good stuff. Uh, so hopefully that explains employees a little bit. Um, if you were to describe your company, you described it just a little bit there uh, as far as what, you, what you'd like for teammates or employee-employer relationship. What does is, what is your company do um, for the most part? Like what, what's, what's going to be your focal point uh, as far as company description? You're going to work mostly on Commercial, residential, and safes will be your specialty? Yeah, commercial, residential, and emergency services. Okay, great, great. Um, so, yeah, for residential, yeah, obviously lock change, um, rekey, stuff like that. You know, I would like to get more into, you know, installing security cameras uh, for okay. people. And then great. commercial, yeah, access control, master king, um, stuff like that. That's really cool. Um, we're actually today. I'm doing a. I'm hosting a master keying secrets class uh, at 4 p.m. Mountain Standard Time this afternoon. So if anybody's out there uh, and interested in that, or you want to try and join in later, uh, just follow my social media channels. It'll be on YouTube and it'll be on Facebook. We'll, we'll stream it out through those two platforms. And I'm working with Harvey Arkaway, who has the RabbitSoft Master Keen program. And he's going to show us some really cool, tricky little things about how to decode keys, how to understand those master key systems better, and just put an overall, um, you know, better understanding out there of what master keying is and how to do it. So that's, that's going to be something to check out as well. Uh, so it sounds like you got a pretty good idea about where your company, how you want to start your company, where you're going. Uh, you've done some market research. How many competitors do you have within a 30 mile radius, roughly? Just roughly. Um, well, it's kind of hard to say because a lot of locksmiths uh, operate mobily. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you mean like where their offices are located or just where they're doing the services? If, if, I, were to do a, if I were to do a Google search in your area, how many locksmith companies would come up? Like if, I, oh. if you just did right now. A lot of them, twenty, maybe more. I mean, I live right in Denver, so there's there's a lot yes. of competition. Okay, so you're you're starting in a metropolitan area, so uh, I can already tell you that Google Ads are going to be way out of budget for a long time. Uh, mm -hmm. the, your competitors are probably um, your competitors. Oh, shit. Um, your competitors are probably. Um, spending a ludicrous amount of money in uh, advertising. Hold on one sec. Um, but um, yeah, that's that's definitely something that you need to know and understand. And that also gives you the opportunity to use different marketing techniques. Google's not going to work very well for you. Uh, you need to get Google guaranteed. You need to start your business. You need to start with the Secretary of State. And um, once you do that, once you start with the Secretary of State and get your business registered with them, then you can 
start your your application with Google, and that's a miserable process. And I've I've heard horror stories. I've even had trying to set up a Google listing for a locksmith company. My business partner John and I tried to start uh, John Wayne Lock and Safe, and it took eight months, almost a year, to get our listing live. And then, unfortunately, he had some things, and we had to we had to go our separate ways. Um, it, it was completely, it was all family related. So it wasn't, it wasn't anything that didn't work out between us. It was just unforeseen circumstances to where he had to move. Uh, so then we had to dissolve all of that, mm. but getting started now is the number one key. You have to get that business listing up and going and listed until then build your Facebook account. Okay. That's the first thing, like right now, after we get off of this call, build a Facebook account, build an Instagram account, build a TikTok account, build a social media platform account on all of those platforms, build a LinkedIn account. Okay. And then continually go there and continually show what you do throughout the day, show your certifications, let people know what you're doing. And you can start advertising on those platforms easier, faster, and much less expensive than advertising on Google. In the meantime, while you're waiting for your Google profile to actually catch traction and actually appear, and then after you get your Google account listed, your main free page account, then you can take it one step further and you can go through the interview process and you can get Google guaranteed. When you have your Google guaranteed blue or green check, that's when you really made it. And that's when you'll start rolling around on those uh, search platforms. And then you start getting reviews and you start doing all these other things along the way to where you can really start picking up some steam and heading in that direction. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, do you have any recommendations for website development? Uh, so I can give you, I can send you a couple uh, people. Um, I'll, I'll just send them to you directly. Uh, one guy, okay. Josh Pothers up in Canada, Toronto Webworks, uh, he made all of my stuff, um, but uh, I'll, I'll send you some other stuff. Preferably, what I would really recommend for people for that would be find somebody local, find somebody who you can talk to face to face and find somebody who you can shake their hand and who you trust. OK, mm -hmm. interview three people yet again, just like your attorney, just like your CPA. You need to do that with your website designer, too, because if you spend all this time, you're on a shoestring budget. If they screw up or they don't renew your account with a domain host or they don't protect it properly or they don't back it up like they're supposed to be doing so, um, that's that's a major problem. And you don't want to have that happen. Right. So you want to make sure that you trust the person you want to. I, I even ask for other people who they've worked with, like, hey, uh, who what other companies have you worked with? And can you show me some of your work? And then I'll take notes on that. And I'll call those other companies and say, hey, how's this person to work with uh, before I commit? That way I know every dollar that I'm investing in this particular person in this website development agency or this person is going to really make things happen. You can also do it yourself on the back end, too. If you're trying to save money, you can go to sites like Wix, uh, GoDaddy. I, I think all of these platforms have some kind of, you know, WordPress. You can build a website with little to no experience. So you can start things on your own. Just make sure that you keep immaculate details, make sure that you back everything up and make sure that eventually you can design it so that you can sh shift that task to another person and just basically, here's all my login stuff. Please maintain my page and my domain and my hosting. Hmm. Right? Okay, yeah, thanks. That's helpful. So, um, as far as organization and management, you're probably going to be pretty straightforward and pretty clear. Um, or what, like, if you're going to use, a, if you're going to use a electronic invoicing service, uh, this company that we're on their page right now is the one that we switched over to Workies. I would really highly recommend um, checking them out. Uh, I'll post a link down below, and I'll send you a link um, to to them as well. Um, they're a little pricey for the year service. But by the same token, when you look at what you're going to pay for a year versus paying an actual bookkeeper or an employee uh, to be an operations manager, it's a fraction of that. So when you look at it compared to a salary, it's nothing. It's it's hardly anything at all. OK, mm. uh, 
but that'll be the next thing that you need to really start looking into. And you're going to have to really look into that because you're going to need scheduling. Workies, I pull up my calendar. It shows all of my jobs. It shows all of my technicians' jobs. It shows all where they're at in real time. I can literally see where they're at on the map. It holds them in the map. It sends my customer a, a review text link after the fact. So you want to start building your review pages. Hey, imagine if that was all crock pot, set it and forget it. It was already set up for you to do. All you had to do was just run your calls like you normally run them. That customer is going to get their uh, text message that says, hey, you've got an appointment tomorrow. Then it sends them another one two hours ahead of time that says, don't forget our, about our appointment today. That's going to make it so you have less cancellations, less canceled calls. So you mm -hmm. make more money and you don't waste time and fuel driving around because you have a narrow, finite amount of resources right now when you're starting up. Okay? You need to maximize those resources so that make sure that your customer is there ready and willing to pay you when you show up to the job. Those are all really, really, really good things to have. And that's why I like that company versus just using like QuickBooks Online. Um, I, I used QuickBooks Online for a long, long time, and it was constantly messing up my taxes because we're mobile. I have different tax brackets, different counties have different tax areas. This is where a CPA and a bookkeeper is going to save your tail because that gets very complex. If I run the job in Aspen and I sell parts there, now we don't have to charge for labor here, but if I sell parts there, okay, uh, and you have to check your own local laws, your own local and state uh, and federal laws in your area, Okay, I want to make that certain. I'm not giving the advice for that. I'm just telling you, your CPA is what saves you from getting in trouble in those particular applications. Okay. So just making sure that you have all of that there, it was messing up the taxes and the tax rates for me. Uh, and, and it just, you know, it kept being glitchy. It kept being weird. And I just fumbled through it and then finally ended up getting tired of it. And that's when we brought Workies on. Now, you're still always going to have to have a QuickBooks account, but your QuickBooks account, well, I don't interact with it every day. I interact with the Workies app now. Uh, the nice thing about Workies, too, is you can actually get a number that you can port into your cell phone. So you were asking about that earlier, right? How do I use my cell phone? Do I use my personal phone? Do I go get a company phone? Well, when you're starting off, I would say probably just start using your own personal cell phone. But if you get a company like this, uh, you can actually have a number ported in and then everybody, like not your personal number will go out there. You can literally turn it on and off. Hey, I'm working. I'm ready to take calls. I want these calls to come in or I'm off duty. I'm no longer running calls. Um, we'll turn that off. So those are those are some mm. really, really good features and benefits about that platform that actually really help you run your business. And I'm not trying to give a sales pitch here. There's there's lots of different organizations that do it. I'm just telling you from me to you, I found this extremely helpful and I actually sought this surface out, not the other way around. Um, let's see here for services and products. Oh, yeah. so, uh, we actually, we use Workies too. Um, and I do like it. Yeah, cool, good, good stuff. Uh, so for services and um, sale, our services and products, your main services and products are going to be what? Um, for residential, it would be just be like uh, knobs, dead bolts, you know, find good deals on those. Okay, good, and good. This is obviously would be what we talked about. You know. Right, so you have a small amount of the basics on the truck, and then you're lucky you actually have a supplier right next to you. So if you do have a big job that comes through and you do need more stuff, you can go to that supplier and you can buy it at the time of. And that's actually going to be one of your, <clears throat> probably, I would say that adding that to your business plan would be a really good idea. Any jobs over $500, any jobs over $1,000, I am going to make it company policy that I need to get a 50% deposit on that so that I can use that deposit to go buy the parts and hold this person committed to their job. Because just because people approve something doesn't mean that you get the job every time. I've been burned so many times requesting or requiring a 50 to 75% deposit for those bigger jobs is common and should be done and is how you protect yourself from getting spread too thin. You are not a bank. Don't pretend to be one. Okay. 
Don't mm. go in there and say, hey, oh, I'll bankroll this and then just expect to get paid. Once again, that's how businesses get crushed. That's how businesses die. So hold them to it. Do not be afraid to ask for that deposit. Do not be afraid to ask for that amount of money right up front, right out of the gate to continue the job. And the way that I do it is I say, hey, this is company policy. I can't order your parts until I get a deposit. Then that deposit is the money for the parts. You take it, you check clears, their invoice clears, whatever. You go to the parts house and boom, you bought it. So that's going to be your services and, and products. Um, we talked about marketing and sales. When you're starting out, Google is the, the big dog. That's where you want to be. That's what you want to aspire to get to uh, would be Google. However, it takes time to set that account up. Now, I'm going to go ahead and since, since I'm laying this out there for a lot of other people who are going to be learning from this too, Google is not going to call you in most cases. Most times, if you have somebody call you, and say, hey, we can set up your Google account, it's usually not actually Google. The only time Google actually calls is when they want to sell ads or when they want to verify your business. So after you, and the reason I say you have to do your Google listing after the Secretary of State, because you're going to need that paperwork that you're going to get from the Secretary of State, including your EIN or your tax ID number, right? You have to have that to prove that you're a company and that you're actually legitimately in business. So you need your W-9 and your EIN number so that you can give that to Google and you can give it to the other social media platforms to prove that you actually have a business that is legitimate, that is registered with the Secretary of State and that the federal government knows about. None of them will let you set up an account for a company until you have that information because they know they're contributing to a company who's earning income. And if the IRS ever audits them, they're going to say, hey, where's your W-9 for this person? You're, this, you guys are exchanging money. We need to see documentation and proof of that. OK, so that's why it's so important to start off there. Um, what is going to be based on the information that I've given you, what is going to be your marketing plan that you're going to start employing first? Um, well, I think the first thing I'm going to do is create the social media accounts because that's pretty much no cost. And, uh, I have the time to do that right now. So, yes. Yep. And, and then, start. you know, moving forward on the website, website development and, um, Looking into getting that, you know, LLC and the EIN, um, I think would be a good step. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Those are all perfect. That's absolutely perfect. Now, when we come down to the last step here of our business plan for financing and funding, um, are you? do you have some personal savings that you'll be able to use for this? Or do you have any family, friends? Uh, this is the time. I, I really hate to, to, to kind of go that route. But trust me, I wouldn't be here if... We didn't go to family and friends at certain times to try and help out and try and make this thing work. I mean, you know, e even just my wife working while I was working on this was a really big help to have a, some kind of income come in so that I could focus and I could really bring this thing to life and bring it to where it's producing now. So what is your plan going to be? Um, yeah, I have some personal savings and um Similarly to how I've, you know, met you, I have um, some other like mentors in my life that could probably help in that way. But I would have to really lay out, you know, what my expenses are. And, you know, I, I wouldn't just be shooting them a text like, hey, can you send me money like for my business? Like I would want to, you know, have it, you, you know, know, very professional, have my expenses listed out, ask them, you know if there's any way that they could help uh, with certain expenses, maybe. And I can guarantee you that anybody that's actually going to give you the money will ask you for a proper business plan. They're going to ask you what your business plan is. And that's why I'm so shocked. They're going to want to see a written out, whether it's handwritten or typed out, they're going to want to see a legitimate physical business plan that has the answers to all of these questions right here so that they understand where you're going and how you're going to repay that debt. Cause now you're taking on debt. Once you take on debt, now you're locked in. Now you have to succeed to be able to make sure that you can pay them back to be able to be a man of your word. Right. All part of it. Okay. 
So that business plan, everybody overlooks this. And I really, I just, I don't get it. I don't know. I don't know what is so hard about writing down a business plan, but almost nobody does it. So I really sincerely hope you do it. Uh, I hope you take time with it. Uh, this is your baby and this is your future. Why wouldn't you give it the time and credit that it actually really does deserve, you know? All right. So let's come on down here and let's plan on some income goals. Uh, let's see here. How much does a locksmith really make? Your average salary is going to be about $46,000 a year. Um, as a business owner, your income could be much higher. I can tell you mine is obviously way higher than that. Um, your income should cover your living expenses, your overhead, self-employment taxes, employment salaries. Uh, and if you have to plan on hiring a team, you want to budget that in as well. Um, you need to know your numbers. You need to know your service prices. You need to know your business expenses and you need to know your yearly salary. OK, uh, once you have the figures, calculate how many clients you need to bring on to reach that revenue. So does that all make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, uh, so you got to understand your prices. And, and this is where I a lot of people get hung up, too, is they get really hung up on. And I even heard you mention it. You get really hung up on. I called the other locksmiths in the area and found out what they're charging. And then I'm going to base my rates off of what they're charging. OK, let me tell you that that's a race straight to the bottom of the hill, because probably what you want to do is you want to find out they're charging my competitors charging eighty five dollars for a service call and one hundred and twenty dollars an hour. I'll charge eighty dollars for a service call. I'll go a little bit lower and I'll charge. $110 an hour and I'll get more work because people are going to call around and they're going to say, you're too expensive. I'm going to hire the cheaper guy. That is the biggest single mistake that every single locksmith makes. No, you need to charge what you're worth and you need to charge what your business is worth and you need to charge what your business needs to make for you to earn an income and a living. We go to classes. We take yearly training. We take time off of work and away from our families to go get this knowledge and information so that we then sell this information back to our clients in everyday jobs that we do. No other locksmith dictates my rates. I made the same mistake when I moved into this valley. Service calls were like 68 bucks and hourly rate was like $65. And we were all racing to the bottom of the hill because everybody would call check everybody and everybody would try and be five bucks cheaper than the, than the other guy. And what do you think happened? It was a downward trend straight to the bottom of the hill to where there's no profit left to be made. So business brain kicked in. This is when I started researching, taking more seminars, going to workshops, going to classes, understanding business books better, reading business books more and understanding I don't care what my competitors are doing. In fact, I actually pride myself on being the most expensive locksmith in the area. And when I made that switch flip in my brain, what do you think happened when all of the other people called me to price check me? They all wanted to be 5 or $10 cheaper sure. than I was because I'm the big dog in town. I'm the leader of this place now and everybody's trying to base their rates off of my rates. Now we're going and trending up because I took that and raised it immediately. Now, I think now by the time we get up to Aspen, my service calls like $155. You know, my hourly rate is $145 an hour. Do you know how I set those rates? I didn't call other locksmiths. I called other industry professionals. I called diesel mechanics. I called specialty mechanics, European car mechanics. I called electricians. I called contractors and carpenters. I called the other people, plumbers, HVAC technicians. I called those people and found out what they were charging in the Valley. And their service call was way above mine, way, way, way above. It. And so I said, if these people are in this Valley are willing to pay that service call for that particular service, they have no skill and did not do any more training than I've done for my service and my skill in my business. In fact, I've probably done more, to be quite frank and perfectly honest. Look at that wall behind me. That's a lot of training. You're looking at 
30 grand in training sitting behind me right here. Okay. That means that I get to charge just as much as they do. So I based my rates on what my company needed, what I needed to make a living, what my company needed to have positive cash flow, and what other people would pay for top tier educated skills and services in the valley. All of a sudden, now, instead of going down, we're going up. And the rates have just been going up and up and up. And now my competitors call me, price check me, and they love hearing how much I'm charging because they all want to be five bucks less. And they can be five bucks less. I don't want the customer who calls me and I give them a price quote for my expertise and they want the guy that's $5 cheaper. I don't want them as a customer anyway. I don't. That's all there is to it. You called me because you want my knowledge and expertise, and my knowledge and expertise is superior to my competitors, and that's all there is to it. So I charge more, obviously. A Kia mm -hmm. doesn't cost as much as a Lamborghini. If you want to drive a Lamborghini, you got to pay for it. So those high-end skill services like the safe work and safe opening, electronic access, and just doing a lot of stuff the other guys don't do is truly the key to my success in that aspect okay all right okay. so hopefully you'll write down your uh your your prices that you want to charge um when you're first first starting out i wouldn't take that approach i would make sure i matched and was right up there with the higher price people because you know people will pay it but then that money is going to go right back into your bank account you know what i mean that money is going to go right back into your pocket and here's a key detail in two five ten fifteen twenty years you can't go back to these customers and ask for more money later. You can ask for it now. So why not ask for it now and put that money in your bank account to help support your business while you're moving forward? This is a huge mindset shift, again, because you're going from employee mode where you're like, hey, how can I save money? How can I save my customer money? How can I do this to how can I maximize the sale ethically? That's what you should be asking. How can I make sure that I offer all of the skills and expertise that I have to my customer ethically to make sure that I get them everything they need and they get everything they need from my services. Okay. That's, that should be your main focal point. Mm. As, far, as far as names and registering your company goes, uh, naming your business isn't just about fun and games. It's about creating an impression uh, for your customers and building a strong brand that makes sales. Okay, we're doing this for sales. You are now selling things. You're selling security through your knowledge and the products that you sell. Uh, I'd like more information on creating a strong brand identity for your locksmith business. You can check out this helpful article. Uh, that's probably going to take us to another page here. Here's a 10-step guide. Uh, this is on that Workies page as well, but we're not going to go over all of that right now. Uh, you'll need to register your business as an LLC or corporation or sole proprietorship. We talked about that. Uh, LLC, LLC is limited liability company. Uh, you can also do a sole proprietorship or there's a couple more. You could even do a partnership as well. Uh, LegalZoom offers these filing services for between $40 and $500. Uh, I bet you'd be right at that $100 mark if you were to use those services. Okay. So do you completely understand uh, name and registering your company with the Secretary of State? Yeah. Okay. All right. Good and stuff. you also recommended uh, using an attorney for that, right? Correct. And they do too. They even say LegalZoom right here, right? Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. LegalZoom or Legal Shield, whichever one you want to go. Um, Colorado's not licensed, licensed yet. So you shouldn't have to worry about that. For people in other states that do have licensing, this is where a lot of people get hung up. Places like Chicago, Texas, Oregon, they all have locksmithing license. In Oregon, you have to apprentice for two years before you can get your, before you qualify to actually get your, your license. I, and, and again, I don't have that information directly right in front of me. I heard that from another person who lives in that area. So don't quote me to exactly how long that is, but I've heard that it takes around two years to actually get your apprenticeship program before you, you have to work for somebody for two years before you can actually go out and get your own. And they do that so that people really know and understand the trade and industry before they just go out there and hang their own shingle. Okay. Mm. So that's good for you here. Um, <clears throat> I see licensing, yeah, uh, licensing requirements by various state. California's application process 
uh, doesn't require training. While in Tennessee, you must complete 30 hours of training. Uh, other states require an exam or apprenticeship. I know Illinois has a license you, or a, a test you have to take. So you have to take a proficiency test, which is actually really, really difficult to do. But that's just what you got to do to work in that state. So check your local state laws. Uh, in general, that's probably another $100 to $200 fee and no felonies. So no felony charges to get into the uh, um, locksmith industry. Okay, that's bad. You're not going to, you're not, people don't want felons having keys and combinations to their safes, unfortunately. Well, probably fortunately, actually. Uh, the next thing is going to be insurance. So do you know anything about insurance? Have you looked into it at all? What, what are your feelings on insurance right now? Or what do you know? Um, aside from the LLC, I don't know too much about business insurance. Okay, so LLC is not business insurance. That is your personal insurance that insures you from getting sued personally. But it is not insurance in any way, shape, or form. It is just saying, hey, instead of suing me, sue the entity, right? This is your LLC. Don't sue me, sue the entity, right? It's not insurance. So okay. don't, it, it's not insurance. You have to contact uh, the Hartford State Farm, uh, whoever you currently go through your uh, home and auto insurance. Always check with them first because they might be able to offer you a bundle deal, right? So if they can offer you a bundle deal, then that's probably going to be the best deal that you're going to get. If they don't offer a bundle deal, again, we go back to th rule of three, contact three insurance companies and get three separate quotes for insurance on your business, insurance on your business vehicle or your company vehicle. And it would be a good idea to have what's called an inland marine policy. Now, I know we don't have any boats and we're landlocked here in Colorado. I don't even know why they call it an in inland marine policy. It has nothing to do with water or boats. However, it does have everything to do with getting extra money for your tools in your van. So let's say you go buy a van, you get your budgeting all done, you come up with a couple grand, you go buy a, a van in cash, pay them cash, and um, you get in a wreck a couple weeks later, right? You buy all your tools and you're all stacked out. You got pin kits, you got, you know, $10,000 worth of tools, key programmers, safe drilling equipment, uh, stock, key cutters, whatever it is. All that stuff gets trashed. What happens? Mm -hmm. Do you know? You're, yeah. Uh, if you didn't have insurance, you'd, yeah, you'd take the hit. But let's say you have insurance. Let's say I have full coverage insurance on, on let's say you have in, full coverage insurance on the van. What do they cut you a check for? The amount of the van. They cut you a oh, check. Oh, the actual the cash value? Of, yes. Yes. So they will look up your van and they'll say, not necessarily your van. what you paid. Right. Exactly. And. Yeah. What happened to all the tools and the keys and the key machines and the blanks and the stock that is now strung out all over the road and completely useless to you? Are, does insurance cover that? They don't cover it. No. No. Under, under normal plans and normal policies, no. Some of them will have a policy to where if it's bolted down, and I've been through this so many times is how I know, at least with my insurance company, and that's all I can speak on. I'm not speaking about other insurance companies. I'm talking about my personal experience. I, my vehicle, I think the vehicles have been in wrecks five, four or five times. And the Inland Marine policy covers all of the additional stuff that's in your truck. Okay. It covers your power tools, your drills, your lockout bags, your lock picks, your key programmers, your safe tools, all that stuff. So I have insurance on the vehicle. So if the vehicle gets wrecked, it's full coverage insurance, walk away. They either fix it and pay completely to fix it back to original, or they scrap it. A lot of times they scrap it and just write it off because it's an old vehicle with a lot of miles and an old junky work vehicle, right? It's not like a Lamborghini. They're just going to write it off, cut you a check for whatever they say that it's worth. And then you'll get a check to go buy a new vehicle. If you have the Inland Marine policy in place, that's when you line item all of those really expensive things like your car key programmers, your Triton key machine or whatever key machine you have. OK, all of those things are now able to be covered because you had a list of them. Like when I was moving safes, I had all my stair climbers, each one of those. One of them was ten thousand dollars to replace it. 
right? And I ended up having to make a claim on some of them because it got damaged in one of the moves. And because I had the insurance claim on it, the insurance actually paid the money. The tracks on one of those things was like $2,500 and it got damaged and I had to fix that. And luckily I had that in the marine policy so that we were able to utilize that and capitalize on that. So now if my truck gets wrecked, they write me a check for what the truck is worth, right? The vehicle itself. I even have the time and energy that I spent on customizing it, all of my Milwaukee packout stuff the two days that it took of my time to set and build that up that I'm going to have to put into yet another vehicle if that gets wrecked. I've got all that factored into it. I've got the amount of the tools and the amount of the stock that I have all factored in to where now we're insured for all of that too. So there's an additional $30,000 on that vehicle so that if it gets totaled out and wrecked, they cut me a check for the vehicle so I can replace it and the tools and the stock so that I can replace it, right? That's what you need to talk to your insurance right. agent about. And you need to bring it up specifically that way. If my van gets wrecked tomorrow and gets totaled out, what happens and what's covered? And you want them to write that out in plain English. And then you will take your insurance policy and you'll take it over to your attorney and have them overlook it too. And then you'll take it over to your CPA if they're willing to look at it and see if they like it as well, because they will see things that you and I are just not trained and smart enough to see. We didn't go to school and didn't get educated to do that. The smartest way to do it is for you to look it over, have your attorney at the very, very bare minimum look it over. And then if you have an additional person, a parent, a friend, bookkeeper, whoever, somebody else that would look it over, it's best to have three people look it over again. You'll notice a pattern here. Everything is in threes. CPA in in uh, <clears throat> um, check out three of them. Your um, attorney interview three of them. Uh, insurance anything that's important, you should have three options for that. Okay, uh, so that would be the next thing to really start looking up is um, what what you can be doing for that for insurance. I would write that down as one of the next things to do. Yeah, it's a good point. I haven't really even thought too much about business insurance. Which is why we're on this call, because these are all the things that people just don't think about sometimes. You know, you're so focused on uh, what do I need and what am I going to do to get started and how do I make money that we forget about this. So insurance is definitely extremely important. Okay, uh, so let's go sure. through business tools. Uh, let's see here. Business tools and equipment. Uh, so we can go through this. Workies has a drop and drag calendar, so you can tell at a glance what your invoice is. Uh, take payment out in the field. Never underestimate the time frames or miss deadlines. Give customers peace of mind with automatic customer notifications. That's what we talked about earlier. Uh, send straight to their phones when you're running late. Um, your equipment, uh, it's essential for locksmiths to have a pick set, broken key extractors, um, you know, just a general, general stuff like that, uh, to be able to do, to do their general job. So what do you think about insurance now? What are some of the steps that you're going to take? Sorry, you broke up a little bit. What, what was that? Um, so what are you going to be doing? What are your plans for insurance after after we're done with this? Um, like you said, I'll probably start researching um, insurance companies and asking them about the policies that they have. Okay. Do you have any recommendations for specific companies that you've worked uh, with? I will start out with whoever does your personal home insurance and auto insurance right now. That's a good starting point. Uh, a couple names for you, State Farm, uh, the Hartford. I've used the Hartford. Um, I think we're going to be switching to State Farm, uh, but those are two that I've I've used personally and professionally. Uh, so that's what I would really recommend right now. And then okay. they do have some marketing nice. advice here as well. Uh, the faster and more affordable way to advertise your locksmith, locksmith business uh, with Marketplace, like you can also get on places like Home Advisor. Angie's List and Thumbtack. And those are actually some really good resources to have here. Um, 
<clears throat> home advisor. So, so right now, these home advisor, Angie and Thumbtack, I personally don't work with a lot of those companies now because I'm an established business and because there's a lot of red tape and stuff that you have to go through. Amazon Home Services is another one as well. However, you're in a different position. For those who are starting a business like you, I would recommend that you start building accounts with these companies because they're going to get you non-Google leads. Again, until you have your Google listing up, you don't really exist, okay? You don't, it, it's like not being in the phone book 20 years ago. How are people going to find you? Yeah. If you're not in the phone book, people are not going to find you. So getting on these other platforms, mm -hmm. Angie, Thumbtack, Home Advisor, uh, Yelp. I know everybody hates Yelp and hates to get the phone calls from them all the time because they're aggressive marketers. However, building that account is still going to be another arrow that points back to your business and gets you in front of eyeballs. I would rather get in front of 10 people who are actually going to call me and buy my service on Yelp or LinkedIn or Facebook or Home Advisor or Angie than a thousand people who are not going to call me on Google, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a good that's point. A, yeah, I didn't think about those alternative uh, marketing strategies. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So you can start up your business in as little as 10 minutes. You can add your services, you can add your contact information, and almost all of these have a free platform. Now, you're going to get bombarded with phone calls to start advertising with them, and they are ludicrously aggressive, over-aggressive, and maybe this video might make it to one of their advertising people, but their over-aggressiveness is why people feel hostile towards a lot of those companies. Um, it's just one of the facts. They're always calling, looking to advertise and get money out of people, and if you do that too much, it starts to irritate people. Okay. Um, you can run a few paid online advertisements with call tracking uh, for quality leads. We just did in, um, I'll actually send you a link. Uh, we did a, a business interview with my friend Travis, uh, who can actually target ads and put ads in a specific area in your area and advertise on the Google platforms for you without actually having a Google account. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's some pretty cool stuff going on there. All right. Hmm. So if you want to fill this out, you could fill this out just like so. And then uh, you could get started with them here um, and go from there. So again, I'll put that link in down below for people who want to try and, and use Workies uh, for, their, for their startup. They have a great business plan starter here. Um, I think this is a really, 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 really cool uh, thing that they have helped to help locksmiths and help people get set up. But this should give you what you need to really, really get started. Um, how do you feel after we've talked now uh, versus before? How do you feel about going forward and, and taking that risk and taking those steps? Um, I feel great. Like uh, I didn't, you know, it's difficult researching things on your own because there's so much controversy and um, having like uh, some step-by-step -step information from, uh, you know, from you, you know, that someone that's done it and someone that's local is, uh, it's really helping me and it's really encouraging for sure. So I feel, I feel a lot better about it. Yeah. That's great. That's great. And I hope this helps other people too. That's the whole point behind it. Um, I offer these free sessions like this for my business coaching because I was where you were. I understand the struggle where you, you are. I understand the fear. I understand the anxiety. I understand what it takes. I understand the determination and the tenacity that it takes to go from employee to employee or, or employer, basically, and uh, to owner. And because of that, I know that funding is usually tight. So the last thing I want to do is charge for these initial services to get people started. So that's what I want to do is I want to give this as a base platform. Use this as your first resource. Do this. Write your business plan out. Come up with the answers to the questions that we came up with today. Fill out the template on Workies. Utilize all of these resources that I've given you today. And then after you get started and you start to get some income coming in, that's when we could really work together and I can really teach you some business coaching stuff that you can afford at that point in time to 
where we can just keep leveling you up. All right, we brought in $100,000. How do we double that? How do we make 200,000? How do we make quarter of a million dollars? How do I make half a million dollars? How do I build employees that bring in four or $500,000 a year? How do I bring my business to start making, to look like it can accept making seven figures a year? And that's when people contact me. That's when I want you to come back and say, hey, I did the stuff. We got started. We built the foundation. Now I'm ready to rock and roll. And that's when we can really, really start amping things up. And that's when it really, really gets exciting too. So I know you're going to get there. I know you're going to be successful. I can just tell you're one of those people. You just, you have that drive. You have that drive and that background. That's just going to power you right through it. And you will be one of those people that has the next problem. I make, I have too many clients. I need to buy another van. I need to buy another service vehicle. I don't know what to do with all the business that I have. Uh, I had a, a young lady call me the other day, and that's exactly what her message on my phone was. Oh my gosh, I'm freaking out. I have too many clients and I don't know what to do. An overwhelm mode. That's where we want to get you, and that's where we're going to get you to in this program, okay? Nice. That's super exciting, and I appreciate your time. Yeah, yeah. All right. Cool, man. All righty. Well, I really appreciate it. Um, I hope you take these things. I hope the other people out there... Uh, we'll take this to heart as well and they'll implement the same things. I don't care if you're starting a locksmith business, a plumbing business, an HVAC business, any service-based mobile business will fall on these core foundations right here. They really, really will. And, you know, companies like Workies are here to help make that easier and help make that better. And um, I'm just happy to help out along the way. And I'm really, really glad to see somebody taking their financial future into their own hands and not allowing it to be dictated by somebody else because you will always get burned because we are all animals. And at the end of the day, if it's gonna be your boss or you, when it comes down to me or you, everybody gets selfish and everybody takes care of themselves. And that's just the way that it is. At least you're setting yourself up to be in a position where you can take care of yourself, my friend. Mm. Yeah. Well, hey, I got some work to do, but uh, we'll stay in touch. And I appreciate right. your Any time. last words? No, I'm just excited to get started. All right, man. Go out there, kick butt, and take names, my friend. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Bye.